on this edition of The Self-Publishing Show. Being a successful writer who makes a good living from their writing is about creating a very sort of streamlined package with your book and being able to present it to readers in a way that they go, ah, okay, I know exactly what I'm going to get from that. I'm going to read it. It's All those things have been delivered and I feel happy. Publishing is changing. No more gatekeepers. No more barriers. No one standing between you and your readers. Do you want to make a living from your writing? Join indie bestseller Mark Dawson and first-time author James Blatch as they shine a light on the secrets of self-publishing success. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome. It is The Self-Publishing Show with me, James Blatch. And me, Mark Dawson. Hello, Mark. How are you? I'm okay. Yeah. Not too bad. Kids back at school. Yes. It's been a big, big week for us both. Um... I see lots of people are posting pictures of uh, Saint Death, Saint mm. Death, I'm not sure how, how you pronounce it, um, out on bookshelves. It seems to be climbing up the WH Smith chart. And WH Smith is one of the biggest booksellers in the UK. It's sort of a news agent, but um, is where lots of people buy their books to read. So that must be very pleasing for you. Yeah, it's hard to say. It's been, no, uh, it is, uh, it's quite in a lot of shops. It was, it's WH Smith's book of the week this week I saw yesterday, which was quite wow. nice. And I saw one person sent me a picture. No, oh, actually, it was me. <laughs> I saw him yeah, yeah. in Salisbury. It's number two in the Salisbury jar. And I don't think that's. Um, I don't think that's necessarily reflecting where it is. Generally, I don't know how how those are um, are slotted, but um, see, it's out there. We'll see how it gets on. It's only been out for about a week, so I'll I'll get some figures in the next few days. But good start. Look at I you. Think. Look at you, the head of uh, the leader of the free indie world, getting all trad. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, you know, no, hi- I'm getting all hybrid. <clears throat> all hybrid. Um, good. Now, if you're paying attention and you're watching on YouTube, I should say that my puppy got hold of my glasses this week, but they're my favourite monitor glasses, so I'm still wearing them despite them having oh, my shattered goodness. and broken at the back here. But um, <laughs> I explained I haven't been fighting. Uh, in fact, I had a very lovely message from you last night. You, you, you know, we exchanged messages about what time would be available for the wrap, and you sent me some kisses and. Actually, I want to know, was, were those kisses, A, a joke, B, you thought subconsciously you were messaging your wife, or C, you're starting to develop feelings for me? All of the above. Wow. Um, it's no, a big it was, moment. It, unfortunately, it was number two. I was um, <laughs> just uh, <laughs> lots of things going on moment with getting kids to various clubs and things, and I just got, I was in a kind of a, I don't know. It's not, Auto I'm, mood, yeah. We've all done yeah. it. We've all called our teacher mum, haven't we, at some point? No, I've never done that. Have you? Did you just? Oh, I, I definitely did that. Um, good. Okay. Look, we are talking about a really important subject today, which is how to write a bestseller. Useful information, right? If only it was that easy. But yes. Yeah. Um, I love the teaching of Susie K. Quinn. I think it it really opened my eyes and it simplified a lot of what we talk about as to why some books get picked off the shelf and read and other books never really gain traction with readers. And uh, we use the F word, we say it's formula, but there are ingredients, shall we say, it's probably a better word uh, to what makes that happen. So that's our interview. It's coming up in just a moment. Before then, Marcus, we have some Patreon supporters to welcome to the self-publishing show. We want to say a huge welcome and shout out to Heather Button. Thank you, Heather, very much indeed. And Miriam Giles. Miriam is from Daventry here in the UK, not too far, somewhere between the two of us, I would say. Um, and they have been to patreon.com forward slash self-publishing show. They've got involved. They've sponsored the show from as little as a dollar an episode. And you get a load of goodies, um, privileges and opportunities as a result of that. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much indeed. Uh, things progressing, I think, in the background on various fronts. We are very close to making an announcement about a new course, which is going to be added to Ads for Authors. So I'll tease that for now and then we'll give the details of that uh, when that is ready. And we are going to, I think we can say, did we say last time we've signed Ian Sainsbury? We have signed contract with Ian Sainsbury for Fuse Books. Uh, Ian won the Kindle Storyteller Award in 2019. Very, very good writer. I've really been laughing out loud actually and enjoying reading the first paragraphs. I've been formatting his books this week. And of course you do some sort of spot checking, you go through and he's a very good writer. I can tell you just from reading, who was it? Jasper Joffe told us he reads the first page 
of submissions and he knows straight away whether it's a good book or not and i can see what he's talking about now you read the first pages of uh, ian's books and you know this is you're in good hands uh with the writer so we have um scientist series that's um undergone a little bit of a transition it's the johnny blue series it's going to be called under us it's a very uh, clever conceit and i think well Fingers crossed it's going to do well. So we're looking forward to launching those probably maybe even by the time this podcast goes out uh, or the one after that, we would have got those out in the wild so people can see what is going on there. And we have a new series from Kerry J. Donovan coming out, DCI Jones. And uh, I think we'll have a little pause after that and then we'll pot potentially be looking at uh, signing a couple more authors on Fuse. So where are we with this type? What's our advice to people, Mark, on this front? Because we are talking, we advocate doing everything yourself. And yet here we are running a publishing company, uh, publishing people and doing a 50-50 split with them. What is the answer? What is our advice? Is, are we sending out a mixed message here? No, not really. It's, I mean, not everyone for, you know, it is, is going to be equally adept at the writing and the, and the marketing. Um, some people are. There are plenty of authors who enjoy doing both I'm, obviously I enjoy doing both and I'm certainly not alone in that but there are some authors who despite taking the course um, and despite knowing that they need to advertise in order to do well just can't constitutionally they just can't get their head around it they, they're not interested they, they perhaps don't have the money to actually advertise um, and, and do those kinds of things so for those people it still does make sense to find someone you can handle the bits that you don't like. Um, yeah. And obviously you need to make sure they know what they're doing. And I think our, our track record is pretty good so far with um, the authors that we've published. And, and you know, people like um, Kerry, not doing so well by himself, doing very well with us. You know, 10 times more money a day, probably more than that now in terms of the actual revenue that he's taking home. Mm. So um, no guarantees, of course, and, and my my advice would still be: it is better to do it yourself if you can. Um, so yeah. if you if you have the the nous and the um, you're you know you're able to afford to do the bits that you need to do, then you're going to get 100 percent of the money back. So it makes a lot more sense to do it yourself. But for those people who just don't have any interest in anything other than writing, then you're going to need some help, um, and that could yeah. be going for a traditional deal. Um, or it could be, a, you know, a, a hybrid deal with a smaller publisher. Lots, not obviously, not just Fuse Books. You mentioned Jasper doing very well. Lots of other little publishers, micro publishers, popping up here and there. Um, just make sure they know what they're doing. Got a good track record. They understand what's necessary, and then you know, look at look at signing with someone like that. Um, so we we've obviously got you know plans to grow Fuse. We've done quite well so far with the authors that we've taken on. I think if we can hit. Similar levels of success with Ian and Kerry's second um, series, and we might look to grow quite fast next year. But you know, yeah. we'll see. And on that front, we should give a shout out to Joseph Alexander, I think, passed a milestone with KDP and his publishing company. So he does music books, very specialist, uh, but does it very, very well. He's run a really brilliant little niche publishing uh, indie company, a bit like ours, but he was there before us and has done incredibly well. So well done to Joseph and uh, a listener to the show. Um, and yes, on the uh, on the printed book front, mentioned your Saint Death. So I I had an order from a museum uh, in the UK that hosts the only sort of surviving and not actually it's not true. It was the only flying Vulcan bomber thing behind me. If you're watching on YouTube, um, and features in my book, and they ordered thirty copies of my book, ten signed and twenty to go on the shelf. And I looked on their website every now and again, and it kept saying. Of the 20 unsigned available and 10 signed, how many available? 10, 20. I thought, oh dear, you know, I've, I've done this this order. But it turned out they just didn't have a very good stock system. They just put 10 and 20 when they first got them and didn't update it. And I got a reorder uh, last month for another 30. Um, oh, cool. So last week for another 30. So that's about a month's time. So that's amazing. And um, so I'm really pleased with that. But it has made me look at, I've done it for them for not-for-profit. So I basically... Um, covered my costs of postage and printing and allowed them to have a markup because it's a charity and I'm happy to support that. But the cost of printing for Amazon works out knocking on £6 a book with delivery, maybe a touch over, which is quite a lot. 
Uh, Ingram Spark this week announced that they're putting their prices up. I think as much as six percent did I see in the email. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, and then there's some some disquiet about that, which does bring us back to that question for us, uh, those of us who are doing everything by ourselves, about a better way of doing this. And it comes down to the old thing: where if you're prepared to invest up front and potentially end up with a lot of stock that's unsold, that's the risk you're going to have. You can get it printed more cheaply. Have you gone down that route in the past? People like Clay are the big printers, I think, in the UK. Have you, have you done any of those those print runs yourself, Mark? No, we, we looked at it before I signed with Welbeck. Obviously, Welbeck, um, my partner, to, um, on the print side to get things into stores, and they've, they've done amazingly well with that. So we've got the kids' book out next year. We've got two Milton books, the third one coming out soon. And they're also interested in doing Atticus as well. So that's that's been really good. And it means I don't have to educate myself about what's what needs to be done in terms of print runs and things and also how to get books distributed uh, and i'd have the contacts in the stores for example they do um but we before that i did look at, i got quotes from clays and a couple of other um printers in the uk to do um offset print runs uh, so if you order 500 say you can order much less obviously the more you order the cheaper it gets and i think we got the price down to sub 250 maybe sub one one pound fifty something like that per, per copy may even have been less than that as well since i i checked that and then of course you have the stock um you can get it distributed through gardeners um and you, you can get into it that way and the few authors are, are looking into that um it, it is a bit more tricky and i wouldn't recommend it for most authors just because there is an upfront cost you can be stuck with a garage full of books that you can't shift so you need to have a good plan, a good business plan with how you're going to get the books and then how you're going to sell them, how you're going to distribute them into stores. Yeah. Now, for, you, for you, for example, you could order 500 copies, for example. Um, you, you certainly wouldn't pay £6 a copy. I, I imagine you'd pay about £2 a copy. Then you, you you have a margin there as well if, if you wanted it and you can then sell 30, 40 a month to the, to the museum. Um, yeah. or other places where you could well, I was thinking Duxford the Science Museum and the, mm. if I yeah. put it together a little package with the Amazon reviews and a copy and send it to the buyer and yeah. say you know yeah. I can retail these to you for four quid or something and absolutely yeah. so you, you have to you know it is a bit of most for most authors again it's the kind of thing that they wouldn't be interested in because it is it's doing learning something quite a lot actually of, of uh, information that you need to digest about how to actually do that um and there'll be some phone calls and you'll, you'll have some, uh, you know, you'll need to educate yourself about Nielsen and, and uh, ISBNs and all of this kind of stuff. So there is a bit of a um, a, a mountain, not a mountain, there's, there's a bit mm, of upfront a, work to do before you can get into that position. Curve, yeah. yeah, learning curve. Um, but, you know, if, if, you know, for the bigger authors, some, let's say pick one at random, uh, Shane Silvers, for example, in the States or Lucy Score in the States, it would be worth them looking at um, finding a printer in the States, finding a distribution method, and then trying to get to leverage the success they've had with the ebooks. books They can say, I've sold 3 million books, whatever it is. That, that's an immediate social proof for a buyer to think, well, if they sold 3 million books in, in digital, they'll probably sell quite a few books in print as well. So it is, yeah. it is something worth looking at for some authors, but not for everyone. And a lot of that mechanism, and that's an old-fashioned business mechanism, logistics that sits around. There are lots of companies. In fact, a friend of mine does this. He runs a distribution company uh, down the road. He's run it for years. It, it started off with cardboard boxes. That's what he did. He sold, But he's now morphed into basically being an Amazon um, guy. So he, he receives, I don't know, a pallet of dog food, and he fulfills the orders. So just always the whole Amazon system is automated and it spits out a thing saying yeah, five you, here, four you, there, three there. You can and do I that as give, well. I could give them a crate of my books under mm-hmm. that same system. You could, yeah. So you, you could take down the, um, the print-on-demand copies and replace those with... Basically, you can do fulfillment by Amazon F- FBA. So um, it, it's a, you become a, an Amazon seller rather than just an author. Um, and there are different ways to do it. You, you can... You could ship a pallet of books to Amazon. They'll store it in one of their warehouses, and then they will pick from those books when they have orders to fulfil. Um, obviously, Amazon will take a cut from that. Um, there's, there's, I looked at this as well a long time ago. There's, there's storage costs, which is worked on cubic um, space that you're taking up, and they take a margin. There's postage, there's packing, all, all of that kind of stuff. But I think you'd probably still, 
I think when I went, when I looked at it, you still come out slightly ahead of what you would with print on demand, but it's close. Probably close, not yeah. enough, not enough that way to to be worth Make the effort. Worth time, yeah. Um, otherwise, a, a lot more people would do it that way. So, but it's an option. There, there are there are ways to do that. And if you ended up with a garage full of books that you couldn't sell, you could look to move them that way by by taking the POD copy down and send and selling the uh, the one that you've got. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, good discussion. Thanks, Mark. Let's uh, let's move back to that question of what to put in your book in terms of the words and uh, invite our favourite guru on this subject, the absolutely delightful and brilliant Susie K. Quinn, a best-selling writer herself who's really thought long and hard about how to instruct the rest of us on the, the ingredients of a best-selling book and how to go about planning that. She's done a course for us. You can find it at selfpublishingformula.com forward slash bestseller. Uh, this is a catch-up, really, of what's changed, uh, what changes may go into the course, and how the landscape looks today. Here's Susie. This is the Self Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Susie K. Quinn. I always wonder what the K stands for. But don't tell me. I, <laughs> I'll try and guess later. Um, welcome back to the Self Publishing Show. How absolutely lovely to see your smiling face and have you. You are. A little bundle of joy. That sounds quite patronising, doesn't it? It does not sound patronising. It sounds wonderful. Oh. And um, I, you, yeah, thank you. You are a bundle of joy. Uh, and lovely to see you too, may I say. And are you in the same house that we once visited? Yeah, I it am. Looks I have a, it, oh, Have I moved anything? I don't know. We're, we're, we're shopping for dream houses at the moment, which mm. is um, sort of, um, it's, there's a moral to that story. The moral is don't wait for things. Do them when you're ready to do them because... We're shopping for dream houses and there's nothing on sale where we are because everyone's moving out of London and yes. all the houses are, um, are gone. Uh, <laughs> so so do we're you, waiting. You want to be in that same area? I oh, love the area, but we just we want to move to somewhere either on the riverfront or bigger with the space and, you know, you know. Um, and you're so, a bit of a property magnet, I seem to remember. That's that's your chosen yeah. outlet for the book money that you make is property, yeah, it's, bricks and mortar. Yeah, sensible thing to do with it. Yeah, so still got those properties, um, and yeah, it's been okay during during lockdown. And everything they were they were okay. It was it was Good. I was lucky, I think. Yeah, so sensible thing to do. Good. Really well, look, we're going to catch up with you about bestseller. You you are the person who came to us with with this sort of basically. I'm going to use the word formula because it sort of is a formula, an approach to yeah. writing a book that means it gives it the best possible chance of selling of being a commercial success and you're very sure. orientated around that which is brilliant and that's why most people listen to this show um some people smoke their mm -hmm. cigars and say well i don't do it for the money well that's fine they don't yeah. have to do it for the money and that's they don't fine. have to listen to this show but this is going to be about kind of being paid for what you're doing which is exactly. not what we should be proud of and shout out about so yeah. You did the bestseller course, which I absolutely love. And I've seen a thriving Facebook group around this. And we've had some success stories, which is great of people. Yeah. I think people, Susie, you probably had a few of these people who who trundled along, as authors do, writing the book that's part of them and like I've yeah. done and, and not yeah. really properly spending some time thinking what do readers want, which is where you start, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. So, by the way, on the, I'm just going to turn my phone off quickly. Um, I've totally been there, done that on the writing the book that you know this is this is the book that's you know the the, the a more perhaps more of a literary book or a book that was about you know uh, my soul kind of laid bare on the pages and things like that. Um, I have been there. That was my my first book that I wrote, um, and um, yeah, so I, I learned the hard way with that book that all that I got a big publishing advance for it. It was all you know, lots of fanfares and stuff. And, um, and then it didn't sell very well to readers. And so I had, I learned very, very quickly and very painfully um, that I needed to figure out what readers wanted or what I was doing wrong, basically. Um, and um, yeah, so that's how I sort of came about writing books that sold a lot more. <laughs> yeah. Being um, well, well, you're not the only one, of course, because Mark Dawson also wrote a couple of literary books. I read, one of them, he wrote Sabina yeah. Collada, which I always quite like the name, and yeah. um, The Art of Falling Apart. That's the one I read. And he described it later as a wannabe Martin Amis. You know, he read, yeah. I don't know, all those big authors, and that's what he wanted to be. And, of course, that's how often we start writing, and it's not a very clever way because, you know, I'm not Ian McEwen. He's serious. Ne never going to be him, and he's wonderful, and I love it. But... It's much better if yeah. I write a book about flying through the valleys at 500 miles an hour in a jet 
for a very yes. specific audience who like reading that. So, and I, you know, I, I was in the process of writing my book when you and I first started talking about this. So I reverse engineered a lot of that and made sure. Sorry, that, James. No, no, no. So it was a long <laughs> process, but it was a good process. And um, there was a, there's an expression they used in anime and Japanese film stuff that Mark and I used to work in the BBFC. You've got a lot of Japanese film to censor, which is quite interesting. But they mm-hmm. use the word fan service quite a lot, where there's stuff in there because the fans expect to see it. And that's how I think a lot of genre fiction works, particularly romance. Romance mm-hmm. readers of a particular subgenre, whether it's sweet romance or billionaire romance or spicy romance, they would expect certain things to happen in yeah. that book. And uh, you've got and that's what I think you've taught people is to understand that and write yeah. that. Exactly. Yeah. To understand the content. So, so you're dead right. I think lots of us as writers, we sort of kick around kind of writing and just writing because we love writing and writing and writing and creating this sort of almost kind of mess, you know, truthfully. And then we try and slap a title on it at the end. And, you know, um, and there's a much more efficient and better way to do it. And you're right, you're totally right about looking at genres and understanding the different um, things that people expect from those genres and and what they would be disappointed not to have. And the other thing that's really important for the whole process as well is these days you sort of live and buy by your reviews on Amazon. So um, if you're not meeting what readers expect on Amazon, even if you've written a great book, if it doesn't read really quite know what it is and it's sort of got a bit of romance, so it's, it's, it's packaged as a romance, if readers aren't getting those sort of keynotes that they're expecting from that book, they'll give it a bad review. They'll be really yeah. disappointed and they'll, they'll let you know, you know, and, and then the book won't sell, you know? So it's really, and there, are, and there are, I would imagine there are millions of books that are actually excellent books, but because they're not sort of clearly packaged and clearly signposted, people were really disappointed you know, by what they got. You know, we all have our times, don't we? When we we, you know, we put a film on Netflix and you and you're looking for, I don't know, an uplifting film, and and you put it on and it's not uplifting, and you feel disappointed and annoyed because that was what was sold to you. You know, um, so I think a lot of being a you know being a successful uh, writer who makes a good living from their writing is about understanding creating a very sort of streamlined package really in, with your book and being able to present it to readers in a way that they go, ah, oh, okay, I know exactly what I'm going to get from that. I'm going to read it. It's all those things have been delivered and I feel happy. Yeah. And I, I think I may have mentioned this last time, the film crash, which uh, Mark, John and I know all about because when we were at the BBFC, it was our most complained about film. It's not <laughs> a bad film at all. It's a really good film. It's a stage play uh, yeah. before in London and then it became a film with Natalie Portman and, uh, God, uh, not Colin Firth, uh, Jude Law and, and wow. Ju- Julia Roberts. And it's got, yeah, it's got a stellar cast in it. And the buses trundled down Oxford Street with the way they marketed it, which is a white background and these big, happy, smiley faces, all of them beaming, <laughs> pearly white teeth, crash, uh, sort of ensemble <laughs> cast, Julia Roberts in particular, you know, sort of linked in with particular films, Pretty Woman type thing. Yeah. And yeah. lots of people went to see it and mothers took their daughters and their girls all went out and they trundled there and what they got was this full-on assault to the senses, exploration <laughs> of sex between young adults and with <laughs> with unbelievably graphic language for that period. Um, we've probably all got a bit softened to that with the uh, the internet and so on. But at that time, it was, and that's why I was complaining. It's a brilliant script. It's a witty, yeah. but it's an in-your-face yeah. script. And it wasn't what people were looking for. It was not. It, 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 con- what the expression we use, it confounded expectations. And that's the reason that yeah. that film got criticised and yeah. complained about is because it confounded expectations. Actually, it was yeah. quite clever because mm-hmm. they got lots of people to go and see it who perhaps wouldn't have seen it had they had a glimpse into the real content. <laughs> so commercially, it may have worked for them, but it's the number one way, as you say, to get complaints is to yeah. confound yeah. the expectations of your readers. So I used the expression reverse engineer uh, earlier, but that is basically what you teach in the course, isn't it? You reverse engineer the process. You don't sit in a room and start yeah. writing. Yeah. You, you start yeah. with what, what, what do you start with? Well, I, so I would say, and obviously, you know, you, you can definitely be a bit flexible with this. Obviously, you know, the creative world is, you know, it, it, it needs a bit of flex and give and stuff. So there's no exactly hard and fast rules. But um, I, my suggestions are to um, start with know your genre, um, to start with an idea of a title. It doesn't have to be the final title, but an idea of a title that, that in some ways is going to tell the reader something about what they're going to get, you know, um, and an idea of a cover. And if you can't think of those things, 
before with and a concept as well one one line concept and um so i'll give you an example of a book i'm writing at the moment that i have is so i've just gone into kids i'm just starting to write kids books at the moment could be a terrible mistake i'm not sure but i'm hoping it won't be um and um the um I, I'm doing a, a sort of middle grade book called Queen Bees. It's about girl bullying, right? So it's going to be called. So in my head, I've got the title is Queen Bees, or might be Queen Bee, um, and the subtitle is going to be Girls Can Be Mean, and then the cover is going to be two girls looking angry with each other, right? So from that kind of anyone going into a bookshop is going to look at that, and they'll have an. They might not want to pick it up and read it, but they'll have an understanding of what it's going to be about. They're going to be right. That's going to be about young girls at school fighting each other in a fight and then the the cover the the description on the back is going to be about bullying and sort of girl bullying and that kind of stuff so people know um either that gives people a very clear idea of what they're going to get so they can like it or not they can walk yeah. away or not but they know what's there so that's sort of my that's that's kind of where you start with really that, that that's the sort of starting place of start with something that if you go into um, a bookshop, you, your head would turn and you'd be like, okay, I know what that's about. That's interesting to me. If I'm of that demographic, if yeah. I'm looking for middle grade books. You know? And this is even more the case with the Amazon page where the, the time the time mm -hmm. spent looking around a bookshop yes, is, is, exactly. is exponentially larger than the glimpse of a thumbnail on an Amazon page. It's got to say instantly. It's got to say instantly. instantly. There, must, ah, there must be someone in the house who can answer the door. Um, <laughs> It's got to say instantly what that genre is. And people not liking it and not buying it is a good thing, right? It is a good thing because you're, get, you're getting rid of all the people that are going to give you bad reviews. And yes, by the way, I should have said with Bookshop, I sort of, I, I'm picturing Amazon. When I say Bookshop, I'm picturing the Amazon pages. Sorry, yes. no one else does that. Yeah. It's just my little oddity. <laughs> um, I'm picturing the Amazon store with the thumbnails and with the, with your little sort of subtitle that you can put up if you want to with the, with the title. Um, so people, they get a big flash of, cover image they've got the subtitle um you know and, and they're going to see the reviews at some point obviously that's really really important but um it's enough you know i've learned with especially my romance books it's enough to get people even with no reviews it's enough to get people buying and looking you know and beyond that one of the things when people say to us our facebook ads or well, they post into our group and they say can you help me my facebook ads not working and mm -hmm. they they may get a lot right it may get targeting Right, mm -hmm. but the first thing that people spot is a disconnect somewhere. So you're mm -hmm. talking about mm -hmm. the, the cover, the title, the blurb, mm -hmm. but there's also the copy in the ad, the image used for the ad. All of those mm -hmm. have to dovetail perfectly for, yeah. it, for it to work. And the Pretty moment right. you get happy, 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 and then an angry looking face on the front cover of a kind of gritty uh, relationship story it's not the happy mm -hmm. romance that you try to sell it yeah. out in the beginning that's the disconnect that's why your ad's not working yeah. and again going back yeah. not because it's a bad book or a book that people yeah. won't enjoy but exactly. you're missing your audience yeah exactly and i think there's probably an awful lot of sort of heartache with writers and pain because we write something that really is pretty decent um but it doesn't sell or we get bad reviews from it and you get a lot of authors who get very bitter about bad reviews you know they're sort of you know like oh i never read the reviews and i think i really think you should because it's as horrible as they are especially the the, the one stars i don't tend to bother because they're usually waste of time or waste of money that's generally the the, the mindset of the one star reviews but two star reviews are really helpful and they're really often will tell you anyway so uh, you know i think writers get you know they they, they go through a lot of unnecessary pain because They've written something that they feel like, oh, I think this is quite good. And then it, then it's shocking to have the, it's not, there's no word of mouth following for it. or it's not, you know, and, they, and then they start to doubt themselves and think, well, maybe I'm just not supposed to be a writer. Maybe my books not, aren't good. Maybe they're not as good as this person and this person. You know? um, and so it's really worth sort of looking at. So James Patterson, most successful author of all time, I believe he still is, I, I believe. Could well be. Um, most profitable anyway, mm. um, and sells the most books, which I would count as yes. a very big marker of success. That's good metric. Um, you know, but, but I, I don't want to downplay another author, but I'm, I don't think his writing would be held up as like, you know, the best, this is the best writing in the world. And that's I think that's true of an awful lot of best-selling authors. You, I, I mean, I, I'm not saying I don't like James Patterson or what he does, but I think if you compare it to, there's obviously a quickly simply written book as opposed to a book that's taken years and loads of research and that kind of thing both of which are wonderful um, and have their merits but 
it's just it's very worth pointing out that the really big selling books are often just things that have hit that yeah. like you said dovetailed they've got the you know the title and the yeah cover it's the, the marketing isn't it that he's a it's, fan, a it's a fantastic but, marketing operation behind the james patterson books it's fantastic marketing but he keeps the ideas so simple the books he never wanders it's all so clean so he delivers a detective book is a detective book he delivers a kid's book it's nothing but you know i mean you know, I feel a bit like I pick on James Patterson sometimes when I do these interviews. I always grab him as the example of, oh, he's so successful, but he hasn't done like loads of research and gone on loads of creative writing courses, I, I believe. Um, I'm sure he does a good amount of research. He gives them now. He does the masterclass, doesn't he? It's a pretty it's a pretty overview of his career mm-hmm. rather than um, you're going to learn a lot about, you won't learn a lot about writing from it. But um, yeah, that's uh, yeah, easy. But when I say marketing, I mean that, you know, that, that's what I'm talking about. The book package, I'm about the cover, the title, yeah, the true. content. Exactly. That's that's the key thing for what works and um, for him. And yeah, he, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And he hits, he hits yeah. those readers. The most commercially valuable readers to us are those whale readers who just rip through series and yeah, um, yeah. we'll pick up an author. They'll pick up Mark Dawson's John Milton series and, six weeks later they've read all 20 books and they've yeah. moved on to James Patterson and, and they've done all, you know, Robert Ludlum and everyone else. They are the people for whom this, you you should be aiming for and for this system works the best. They're the ones who glance yeah. and think, oh yeah, I do like Lee Child, so I will try that. Yeah. And then exactly. and then they'll post the bad review and it's nothing like a Lee Child book. Yeah, um, yeah, so, exactly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that's the other thing as well as writers that, we get wrong and sometimes publishers get wrong too is they think they see you know if they put like if you loved lee child they know if they put that on a book it's going to get foot it's going to get footfall and people will pick it up but obviously you can't do that unless your book genuinely like mark dawson is a lot like lee child you know and, and will really satisfy those readers and they'll find it hits the, the notes they're looking for so yeah so what's the experience of being the course tutor been like i mean you're in the groups i know quite a lot if a lot of people go through Every week we see people going through the course. What's that been like for you? Oh, it's been amazing, actually. It's been really lovely. I love talking to people in the Facebook groups. I love seeing when they've got, when they've hit a bestseller chart um, and, or just when they've got a fantastic title and a fantastic cover and it just looks so great. And I'm like, oh, that's just brilliant. Like, you know, I so want to read that book. Um, I think my favourite things are when people have been writing for a long time and you know they're pretty decent, you know, they've had enough experiences that they, that they're, they're a pretty decent author and they know that, that you know, they've, they've had the practice, but they haven't, for whatever reason, they're not quite, you know, hitting, they're not, they're, all, they're not getting the readers and then they take the course and then they're like, ah, I get it. You know, I get it. All I had to do was just move this around a bit, think of it in a slightly different way. And now I'm away and, and, and you know, and, and selling books and making, you know, making a profit from it. Um, so yeah, it's been, it's been really nice. Um, yeah. I enjoy that Facebook group. I haven't got COVID, by the way, <clears throat> but I have had this coldy summer cold for a while. I've tested myself. Uh, I have to explain you're to everyone. Getting summer colds, aren't we? Because we've been <laughs> it's coming back. Up. You cough away, James. Thank God, you. I it's going to be a bad flu season, bad cold season. I'll tell you now, but uh, a lot I better, say... a lot better than a global pandemic. <clears throat> um, I, I yes. have um, an unpleasant tip for you. Oh, go on, go on. Like, buy an organic veg bag. You'll never get another cold if you don't get one already. An organic veg bag. Yeah, but you might already get an organic veg bag, so that might be quite patronising. But I've never seen that we got an organic veg bag. I'm not a big fan of vegetables, but you have to eat it because you've bought it and <laughs> haven't had a cold since. We used to get them, and I think we used them a lot. A lot of soups got made to start Lots off soups. with, <clears throat> and yeah. then at some yeah. point stopped to get them. We could get them. There's a couple of companies locally do them. I'll look into that. Thank you. Someone yeah. told me zinc the other day as well. They said the same thing. Take zinc, yeah. and you'll never have a cold. Um, good. Okay, well, look... Uh, Brilliant that you've done the course. It's a t- pretty much a timeless course. I think of all the courses we we do, it's the one that requires the least amount of maintenance because it is the fundamentals of writing, which are not going to change yeah, tomorrow. which is not going to change. Or <clears throat> yeah. the day after. There's a bit of tinkering here and there, of course. But uh, you can check it out at selfpublishingformula.com forward slash bestseller. And there's everything you need to know. There's a big smiling picture of Susie K. Quinn there. Special um. K. Is that what you got called? Special K. I like that. Like so do you want to know why the K? Go on then. Tell- why is okay. it? It doesn't stand for anything. So it doesn't stand for anything. I don't have a middle name. Uh, my parents were too, you know, they yeah. were radical like that. They, you know, didn't have, don't have a middle, middle name. But Susie Quinn was already taken on Twitter. And so when I was sort of trying to kind of create branding and stuff like that, I thought, okay, I need an initial. So I just literally went through the Twitter handles going Susie A. Quinn, Susie B. Quinn, got to K. It wasn't taken. I thought, oh, I'll grab that one. 
there's a, there's a K in JK Rowling. That must be some, you yes. know, must be a, a bit of luck there, you know. Um, and um, so that's it really. This, that's really the only reason. Wow. It's, so yeah, is, how, how shallow. Doesn't stand for, no, it's not shallow. It's great. Well, you could pretend your name's Kate or something if you wanted a middle name. I mean, do you feel regretful about this decision your parents made? Or are you, well, are you suppose, come to terms with it? I suppose I, I regret the fact I hadn't thought about the names that begin with K. I really apologise. But it was the first one you go to is Karen. And you know, that's a thing at the moment. Mm-hmm. Isn't yeah, there? Karen's it's complaining Karen. middle-aged women, yes. Which is a yeah, bit, exactly. bit derogatory, I feel. But anyway. It's a bit, dro- <clears throat> bit derogatory because I know, I know some nice Karens. Poor, poor. I feel very sorry for them. So and anyway, and, the, and people who genuinely about. have a complaint every now and again can't all be labelled Karens. Exactly. But yes, yeah. anyway, uh, yeah. Exactly, yeah. Um, so, so not Karen, uh, but Kate's a nice name, and we've got a princess called Kate, Kate haven't Kate's we? Kate's a nice name. I've got a sister, Catherine, so she's twin sister, Catherine. We were at Harrogate, um, the crime festival this year, very quiet, um, mm-hmm. and it was very cool. We met lots of author buddies, um, but quite a lot of people don't know I've got a twin sister. So I oh. came the first day. Um, and I was saying to everyone, like, I, I was speaking, who was it? Mark Baratif, he's loads of fun, um, and um, briefly spoke to Ian Rankin. He's, um, oh. he's, he's an introverted fellow. Nice, nice right. man. Um, <clears throat> and, Classic writer. And loads of other really, really, really cool authors. Um, and um, I was saying to them, I've got a twin sister, by the way. I'm, you know, I'm going to, she's going to come up tomorrow. And, it, and I think quite a lot of them thought I was joking, but I really do. Uh, and, identical um, twin? Identical twin, yeah. So wow. she came up. Yeah, so we don't look that identical these days, but if I walked out the room and she came in, you probably would assume it was me because, you know. um, Yeah, so I was sort of saying, you know, I don't want anyone to be confused. Does she have a middle name? No. (laughs) But she writes says, um, this is nice. She writes to C.S. Quinn, so she's taken my initial for her middle name. I should have done that. That's what I'll say. I'll say, Kath, it's your... I couldn't be S.C. Quinn, so I I was S.K. Quinn, like Kath. There you go. So there we go. Let's let's round it up that. I'm, J- I'm, I'm J.R. Blatch, which is whenever I say that, people think of that Yellow Pages advert of J.R. Hartley fly fishing. <laughs> J.R. Hartley. J.R. Hartley? No, Blatch. Um, <laughs> okay, like, let's move on to your big career change. Well, not really a career change, but you're dabbling now, experimenting in. Your midlife in. crisis. Your midlife crisis. You haven't bought a sports car, yeah. well, you may have done, but in addition to that, you are writing children's books. Why? Why? So, um... Why? Why? What an excellent question. Oh, you question. don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure why. <laughs> um, I think because, probably because of my kids, probably similar reasons to the way to why Mark is, 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 has written a children's book. You know, I've got kids my age, and I suppose it's probably a slight show-off thing that you want to, you know, they want to read my books. And my, and actually my eldest girl, she is reading my bad mother's books, and she says this really funny. There's a few pages I've earmarked to say, don't read that unless right. you want to feel sick. Yeah. But but one minor sex scene. But um, other than that, she's she's enjoying them. But I wanted to write something that's probably kind of for their age. I also sort of see there's a lot of longevity with kids' books. Um, you know, in lockdown, I really sort of saw how um, you know it's it's very. Whereas with I suppose with adult books, you know, there's a lot of alternatives. There's a lot of distractions. You definitely always get your series readers, and you get people that read prolifically and hate TV. But you also get TV as a distraction. With kids, this sort of seems like a real reason, like parents really want kids to read. So there's a reason to, you know, spend eight pounds on a book and buy a print book and that kind of thing. Um, and so I suppose there was that slight commercial thing, but also, you know, I just, I, I, when I was a kid, I read so much. I love kids' books and young adult books. You know, I used to have, we go on holiday and I would literally have a suitcase of 12, but how many books I could get out of the library would be my suitcase for, you know? Um, and so I, I just quite like that age, I mm. think. But well, let's see if they like the books. That's the. <laughs> so this is young um, teenagers or so younger than that? At the moment, I think middle grade. Middle grade. So which, which is basically eight to 12. Um, and um, so, um, yeah, so I'm doing one sort of magical, fantastical one and one very non magical, fantastical one about girl bullying. Um, and just, I kind of, I'm sure they'll be absolutely great and fine. But um, I think it might take a while for me to get to understand what this audience wants. And just like with with, say, romance, you know, we're talking about readers have a certain expectation and you have to learn that and meet that. You know, if you're if if you read a lot of romance, you're going to be a great romance writer. You know, if you read a lot of thrillers, you're going to be a great thriller writer because you'll understand it. Um, I'm yeah, I imagine there'll be a few things I'll have to learn along the way of ah, kids really like this and they really hate this, you know. 
I, I, so, from the outside, I think they kids like things that are a bit naughty, don't they? Yes, they sort of soul, like things that are a bit disgusting. Yes. And um, um, who's, yeah. the, who's the comedian? Walliams, who now is a prolific children's writer. His books are yeah. always a little bit on the edge, or at least they come across that yeah. way. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, they're kind of on the edge of, oh, should you really say that about yeah. your teacher? You know, that yeah. kind of thing, yeah. Yeah, I think definitely, I think they do like that. Um, I'm going more for the sort of, um, oh, I don't know, like Judy, there's the Judy Bloom star with the Queen Bee book, and then I'm going sort of, Oh, I guess Harry Potter style with the, the fantasy book. That's, you know, that's been, that's the one I, I'm not worried about the Queen Bee one. That that will be fine. Um, the the fantasy one, and this is a lot of people, when I was doing the course, they send me emails saying, what about world building? Hmm. Um, so I'd say, well, I can't tell you about world building because I've never done it. So there was a kind of element of, let's see how that goes. Um, what I can tell you about world building is, um, it's difficult. Um, and, um, the research is is just wonderful. I, you know, a lot of it is is researching some really interesting part of, say, medi- medieval life, or you know, and then translating it into something a bit more magical and a bit, you know, more interesting. Um, so I think George R. R. Martin did. He just sort of immerses himself in medieval, you know, um, history. I think it was, and, and things about like he read like loads of books about weapons, and he just sort of like you know absorbed them. And then wrote his fantasy and sort of ideas from that. Anyway, so there you go. So, so that's, and where are you with these? Are, are, this, are you published yet or? So they're pretty, they're not quite written. The Queen Bees one, I'm halfway through. The, the Huxley Sparks one, I finish and I'm constantly reworking. And I think I probably need to leave it alone and get it out there. But I can just see things that are not, don't have quite enough layers and weight um so i'm yeah and and again i was saying to you before we started i'm kind of at that the thing with self-publishing is like i think is is the best thing ever the best thing ever i still have that stupid writer's urge to go i want a big publisher to come along and 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 wave a magic wand and you know and i know it's not real i know it's not real i've seen it be not real you know um but i still have that thing of maybe because it's a kid's book and it'll be in print more i don't know but i i'm what tends to happen with me is i do it i remember why i i that it's not a good idea and then i self-publish and it's wonderful and i think oh, i'm so glad i did it so there you go yeah well good luck with that i'm looking <laughs> forward to um to seeing those and an interesting experience i mean that's not just going from romance to thrillers whereas basically yeah. stories are stories and and Adults, so you're moving into a different way of writing with children. I imagine took yeah. some adaptation. Yeah, it did, and and so you have to be much with the word count and things. I I am aiming to do a much shorter word count because I remember being a kid and yeah. I would have wanted a shorter, you know, forty thousand words. Yeah, you know, Harry Potter's eighty thousand, fair enough, but they were I long, think, though, weren't they? Yeah. For they were long even for adults. I think they had a couple of the Harry Potter books. Yeah, 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 and you know, obviously they work tremendously well, but I think. Anyway, it's getting a story. Uh, my problem was telling too much story and going, oh, okay. you just got to get rid of all those stories and just yeah. stick with a central so, one. So 40,000, is that your kind of target for them? Yeah, that's my target. And it, it, you're right, it is a different way of working because you obviously you have a story in your head, you know, for the books you're going to write and you have a certain feeling of the length it's going to be and you with basic simplicity. Kids' book, I think all books, we should keep them simple and kids' books – Mm. even more that exactly. clean story. this is what it's about it's about two girls picking on each other you know you can tell it in a sentence you know yeah um yeah well you'll get the package right we know that but that's a difficult thing to write that that length is it was it mark twain famously said apologize for writing a long letter because he didn't have time to write a shorter one <laughs> it's difficult writing a writing short um okay now in terms of the um uh the course itself and what we teach you we said it's timeless and things don't change over time but i wonder mm if it is more difficult these days to get into those charts and perhaps it certainly we know we know for sure it's more difficult than it was 10 years ago which makes this yeah. even more critical getting this packaging right do you think that's kind of accentuated the need to nail everything down now um yeah i really really do because i think when first publishing first sort of really took off and was a thing um it was i wouldn't say it's easy but it wasn't as it, you could get away with not, you know, you could get away with a lot more, you know, you could get, if, so for example, if you were in the romance genre, um, I saw lots of self-published romance authors who, you know, the, the concept wasn't all that clean, you know, it wasn't, I don't mean clean, like, as in like, yeah, yeah, yeah. it was, you know, 
very anyway, clear. Let's not go there. Yeah. Um, but, uh, they, they, you know, they, they didn't have an immediate concept that you'd be like, oh, wow. But because, but it was a romance book. It was 99p. There was a cover with with some, an attractive man on it. And they were, you know, pe- people will buy it, you know, because they, they were like, oh, that's cheap. And I like romance and I'm going to stock up my Kindle. You know, now I think um, you have to, I mean, this is all, it's always a good thing to do. But I think more than ever, you um, having that, that, hook that grabs people that they want to look at the first page that they're going to turn their head and 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 spend a bit more time and go okay let me engage with this you know then a bit less forgiving because there's more um self well more content full stop you know on amazon um and more people who are getting good at using adverts i think um you know it's i i would always like to look at self-publishing as actually easy it's quite easy in in a way if you get it right if you get the concept right it's not so difficult you know you put the book up there it's in a bookshop there's millions of eyeballs on it it's when you think about um 10 15 years ago where where maybe 20 years ago i suppose time has passed 10 years ago when when it was you know you you had these gatekeepers with with publishers and you know um it was you know so many good books didn't get to see the light of day ever yeah, because shame. they weren't allowed. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a shame. But so now I, I actually think it really is much, much easier yeah. today. Really. I always, I always think yeah. about those people who sl- slunk back to their jobs as solicitors or librarians mm-hmm. or, mm-hmm. or teachers or whatever. And fine, you know, they had a kind of okay career, but they could have had a career as an author if they yeah. were doing it now today when you have an opportunity exactly. just to publish. Yeah. I completely agree. And um, yeah, with Fuse Books, we've, I wouldn't say it's been easy, but it's not. We haven't had a lot of resistance in taking series from that weren't making money to making money, good money. Yeah, um, yeah. and that's because, yeah. but it's because of that alignment. If what you go into detail yeah. about in the course and you spell out how to do it, getting that how right exactly. is absolutely critical to it. Um, great. And it may also say it's it's fun. So it's really fun. It's, it's it's not. You might sort of. You know, people might sort of think of it you know, in a more cynical way. Oh, you know, we're sort of sucking, you know, we're commercialising, we're commoditizing. Yes. It's actually, as creative <laughs> people, what could be more fun than coming up with, you know, just spending a bit of, spending an hour. I'm going to give you an hour. You can kick around a book title and a cover idea and that kind of, you know, it's, it's really, it's a, it's a fun, fun thing to do. It really is. It's a fun yeah. group. And people only say that about books, by the way, don't they? That sort of accusation that you're commercialised. Yes. If you're making yeah. lawnmowers, they don't say, well, this is a, commercial <laughs> lawnmower you haven't made this to be a work you of art people yeah, are just yeah. going to buy this to cut their grass <laughs> you fool yeah it's yeah. true but uh, we're hard yeah. on ourselves okay Susie um, well done for the course I think it's a brilliant addition in our stable it's done absolutely brilliantly we were we had our socks knocked off didn't we in the first month when it yeah, went to sale, <laughs> everyone grabbed yeah. it in large I think numbers I we all sort of thought oh you know it'll do nicely yeah. but that was a surprise yeah yeah, and that's gone really yeah. well. And everyone holds on to the course once they've got it. And it's still there, um, doing great guns today. So selfpublishingformula.com forward slash bestseller. Uh, we'll have to have you back on, I think, for a um, a refresher course, perhaps on the webinar at some point in the next, uh, perhaps early 22, if you're available for that. I would love to. Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll fill well, out my... By which time you'll be um, a very wealthy children's author and on the TV and stuff. Well, that's always the, you know, it's always a projection, isn't it? This, yeah. you know, I'm never projecting to be a poor author. That would no. be, uh, you know. <laughs> and I'll have, to speak, I'll have to speak to your agent and they'll say, well, she doesn't really do podcasts anymore. Yeah, I don't, you know, <laughs> I, I always, always will. But to be honest, I, I, I'm so in love with self-publishing. Also, I know I talk about publishers sometimes and stuff, and I do obviously work with the publisher as well. But the self-publishing is the thing my heart feels so incredibly grateful for that you've always got, it's so empowering. Yes. But even if you work with a publisher as well, you've always got the choice because make no mistake, if, if you're an unpublished author and you're listening and you're thinking, you know, you, you really want to have a publisher, you, they, they can come with big problems. You can, you can fall out with your editor. You can have someone who, you know, don't work with well. And to be able to not have that sword hanging over you that's like, you've got to play the game because otherwise your publisher might ditch you to think, well, do you know what? I can self-publish and, yeah. and do my career that way. It's very empowering and, and a lot of fun. Yeah. There was someone on social media where I think he was a bit of a troll and people started <laughs> sharing his post, but he basically was, was lambasting self-publishing from a published author point of view. One of yeah. his complaints was that, um, what was his complaint? Is that every self-published author is taking a slot away from a real author. <laughs> uh, who's going to get a deal uh, and, and he went on like that but he also said I never pay for my editing I never pay for my covers I never pay for my right. marketing 
And I, the only thing I did, I didn't really want to get drawn in, but I just posted this one thing and I haven't gone back to check it because I don't want to get in row because I think he was <laughs> trolling. But I'd said to him, your publisher's paying for all that. None of those services exactly. are free. Your exactly. publisher's and, paying and for them. And they're taking 90%. And by and the way, that yeah. Christmas party that yeah. you go to is paid for by you. Museum that costs millions. You're paying for yeah. it. Yeah. And I said, yeah. if, and it's great. It's a great thing to do because it's no hassle for you and you don't have to worry about it. Mm -hmm. But if your book's selling successful, you've paid an awful lot for those services. You've paid yeah, way exactly. over the odds for them and you could have paid for you know a few thousand, a fraction of that, and now be enjoying the income. So that's a choice you make, which is not it, you know, it's a it's a choice you make with your eyes open, but to complain afterwards, of course, I think it was just to complain afterwards is yeah. I think it's somebody's creating an account to a goad us. He's goading us, ignore him. Anyway, Goading. I'm not gonna quote him. Thank you, Susie, <laughs> so much indeed. Susie K Quinn. I mean now we know what K stands for. <laughs> Special K, we'll call you. Um, brilliant, thank you very much indeed, and we'll look forward to having you back on again some sometime soon. Oh yeah, I can't wait, James. Can't wait. Always a pleasure. This is the Self Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. There you go, Susie K. Quinn. Love talking to Susie. She is absolutely brilliant. Uh, she's a tour de force when it comes to entrepreneurialism. And uh, yeah, I really like her. I really love the fact that she's been through that thing that you went through that I sort of went through in my mind but never did it, which is when you think about writing, you think of yourself as this amazing literary author who's at some point going to be holding uh, the Pulitzer Prize in their hand. And it's a disastrous route for everyone to go down unless your name is Ian McEwan or who's your favourite author? It's um, Kingsley, not uh, Martin Amos, isn't it, I think. Um, uh, for most of us aren't. In fact, the vast majority, 99.9% .9 of writers are not those people. And we actually, luckily for us, write the stuff that people love reading on the tube and on, on trains. And it, it brightens up their day and they get absorbed and lost in these little adventures that we create, whether it's romance or thrillers or whatever. That genre of fiction, it's always been the whale aspect of publishing. Um, and so Susie really understands that. How, did, when you wrote your first two books, we should say a little bit of history for you. You did have two traditionally published books. Do you look back and think that you were trying to be that big literary author at that point? Had had you not even gone down the route of thinking, I'll do, I'll just do genre fiction, oh, or, no, or, no, or really no, drawn the distinction between them? Never thought that at all. No, I um I was too snooty that in the early days. I, I thought I was going to be you know writing these amazing stylistic stylistically perfect books. Um, and and number one, that's not me as a writer. I can't do that. Um, I know these things because I'm older and I've pulled my head out of my ass. Um, so I, I, I knew I didn't have the talent for that. And also, um, they don't, you know, I sell more books. I think most authors will sell more books writing genre fiction. You know, Richard Osman, the big, uh, you know, kind of success story this year um, with uh, Thursday Murder Club, whatever it's called, the old folks mm. solving murders. And that, that is, that's a very, you know, it's genre fiction, it's crime, mm. cozy crime. Um, and he sold. I don't know how many, certainly it must be millions now in, in the UK. It's been at the top of the charts for, for weeks and weeks and weeks and doing well in the States as well. Um, so The second one's out now, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, he, he, now he's done amazingly well. And that, that's pure genre fiction. Um, then on the other hand, you've got something like Sally Rooney's new book came out last week. And I think that I've just read uh, it's the biggest selling book of the year in three in, after three days worth of sales. Um, so I mean, that's that's another example but the, the kind of the, the lesson to take away from that is is just you should write what you like to to write you know don't I, I think I was trying personally to force myself to write something that I just it just doesn't suit me I, I'm not that kind of writer well, I'm not. also write what you're capable of writing we have to be honest with ourselves I'm not capable of writing an Ian McEwan book I read his books uh, with amazement I like staring at the pyramid or something I don't don't mm. begin to understand, comprehend how that was put together. Yeah, there's no, that doesn't mean that that's better than anything else. And I'm not, I know you're not saying that, but it's not, his writing is not better or worse than anything else. It's not better or worse than Lee Child. Um, you know, you can get into. Well, there is no better or worse, is there? It's that's a very no, subjective thing with a bit of art, anyway. It's just enjoy, so. you know, enjoyment. You know, do I, I love Ian McEwan too, so I mean, I enjoy reading his books. I could, you know, I could admire his prose. I, but Ian McEwan probably couldn't write the kind of completely unputdownable book that um, David Baldacci writes, for example. Mm. Um, they have very different skills. And in, in the early days, I was really stuck up about it. And I, there's a writer called Matthew Riley, an Australian adventure writer, 
who's published by my editor at, at Macmillan, and, and he was selling lots and I wasn't selling any. So I, I kind of looked at what he was doing and I thought, well, that's got to be really easy to do that. Just, you know, stupid, you know, big budget movie type um, thrillers, you know, no, no, very little connection to reality, blah, blah, blah. So I thought, I'll write one like that. And it took, after, you know, three or four months of trying that, I realized that I was being a complete idiot and um and it's not as easy as that um so i i couldn't do that i couldn't write his kinds of books um there's a real skill in getting the readers to continue turning the pages and he he had that and that's why he sold so well because he's very good at it um yeah so yeah it's you know write what you like you know and, and we've talked about this before in terms of if you want to be kind of writing to market it's a venn diagram so you write what you like on the left hand side that's one circle the right hand circle is what readers are looking for and you try and find that intersection between the two where they overlap what what you like what readers want that's a good place to aim your writing um because you'll yeah. enjoy the process and hopefully if you're good at it you'll sell books as well so that's that's the best advice i have for someone who's just thinking about getting cracking on on writing Good. Avi words. Aviation books, aviation geeks. Yes. Yeah. There you In go. In the middle, Perfect. there you go. You're happy. I found them. Um, and if you want to know uh, how to approach it technically and what you need to do to put in place to make that happen and realize and, and don't make mistakes along the way, I would thoroughly recommend Susie's course, uh, self publishing formula.com forward slash bestseller or one word. Good. Thank you very much indeed, Mark. Good chat. Good discussion this week. Uh, great interview from Susie. We'll be back next week. Have a great weekend, everybody. All that remains for me to say is it's a goodbye from him. And a goodbye from me. Goodbye. Goodbye. Get show notes, the podcast archive, and free resources to boost your writing career at selfpublishingshow.com. Join our thriving Facebook group at selfpublishingshow.com forward slash Facebook. Support the show at patreon.com forward slash self-publishing show. And join us next week for more help and inspiration so that you can make your mark as a successful indie author. Publishing is changing, so get your words into the world and join the revolution with The Self-Publishing Show. <laughs>